I want to invite uh, Michael Abrash up in just a moment. I, before I invite him out, I'm going to just tell you a bit about him. He's a chief scientist at Oculus. How many of you know what Oculus is? Right, I figure this is a generational thing. All of the young ones in here know what it is. How many of you have tried an Oculus device? Okay, so many of you have, but you all know what it is, and it's kind of amazing. I mean, it may not be all that amazing to you, but to people of my vintage, the idea that something like that exists, even in its early stages, is amazing. He's going to talk to you a bit more about uh, where uh, virtual reality goes. He's a technical writer. He specializes in code optimization and uh, a bunch of things that I don't know what they mean, so I'm just going to skip over that. Uh, he studied at the University of Pennsylvania. He was a game programmer in the early days of the IBM PC. His first commercial game was a clone of Space Invaders called Space Strike. He worked at Microsoft on graphics and assembly code before returning to the game industry at id Software. After leaving, uh, he joined, he went to another company, then he joined Oculus VR, uh, and you all know what Oculus VR is. He's going to come out here and have a conversation. Warm welcome for Michael Abrash. Great. Well, I was delighted to see how many of you have actually tried VR, because I think that'll give even more meaning to this talk. And just because I think the more people will try it, the more people will understand exactly how much difference it will make in the long run. Um, do I have slides? Great. Uh, do I have slides with the format we talked about earlier? Um, well, I could start winging it, but uh, let's give it just one second here. Fantastic. Thank you. OK. So I am delighted to be here today to talk about the grand challenge of virtual reality. And it truly is a grand challenge in terms of the time span, in terms of the breadth and depth of technology, and in terms of the potential impact on the way we live. So VR dates all the way back to Ivan Sutherland's Sword of Damocles in 1968. And yet, nearly half a century later, and with millions of VR headsets in people's hands, we've only just barely started down the road to what VR can ultimately be. And it's when we talk about what VR can ultimately be that it becomes clear how great its potential impact is. So the place to start in understanding that is with the nature of human experience. The reality we experience is constructed in our minds based on a great many assumptions built into our genes and learned during our lifetime and the very sparse data that comes in through our senses. So that's not obvious if you haven't thought about it before. I'll say it again. The reality we experience is a construct in our minds based on highly incomplete data. It generally matches the real world well, which is not surprising, evolutionarily speaking. But it is not a literal reflection of reality. It's just an inference of the most probable state of the world, given what we know at any one time. So let's take a look at some examples that show that it really is just a best guess. See the white tile under the desk? See the black tiles outside the desk? Now let's mask off everything else. They're both exactly the same shade of gray. But if one of them is in shadow and is that shade of gray, it must be white. And if one of them is in bright light and is that shade of gray, it must be black. Intensity is an inference based on context. And your visual system does that inference for you automatically. And what you actually literally see is white and black rather than gray. Here's another example. Take a moment and figure out which of the two tabletops is wider as measured as a 2D shape on the screen, and which one is longer, if you rotated them to line up. Ready? They're exactly the same size. Like intensity, size is an inference based on context. Now, let's look at a few somewhat entertaining cases of higher level inferences that don't match reality. Clearly, what we're seeing cannot be right. Several cues on the window imply a perspective that doesn't exist. So your visual system concludes 
that the window must be spinning backward for a full rotation. In order for that to be correct, the straw has to rotate right through the window. So that's what you literally see. Even though it's not happening, it's not even possible. Let's look at another one. Again, this cannot be right. Once more, our perceptual system is making a very reasonable assumption. In this case, that objects, especially faces, tend to be convex. So here's the really fun part. Try to keep the face from turning convex again. Some people can do it, but it's hard to keep it from snapping back, even though you know the real shape. And once you lose it, you can't get it back. <laughs> Finally, we come to what I consider to be the single most convincing illustration that the reality we experience is nothing more than a best guess. First, I'll play this video. Obviously, she was saying bar, bar, bar. Now, let's watch another video. Here, we clearly heard her saying far, far, far. What's really interesting is that she wasn't saying far. The video showed her saying far, but the audio track was the audio track from the first video of her saying bar. So I'll repeat that because it's hard to believe. She was saying bar, not far. And yet we clearly heard her saying far because the visuals implied that sound. Now this may be a little confusing, so let's look at it in a different way. Once again, the soundtrack will say bar. This is gonna be the same soundtrack it's been all along, but this time there will be a split screen with one face saying far on one side of the screen and a face saying bar on the other side. As this plays, move your eyes back and forth and observe how what you hear changes. Again, move your eyes back and forth between the faces and see what you hear. And if that doesn't make you question the nature of reality, I'm not sure what will. <laughs> so it's impossible to experience that and not realize that the reality you personally experience is an inference. It's not a literal, literal reflection of the real world. So when you heard far, a Fourier transform would not have shown that sound anywhere in this room. The sound far never hit your eardrums, but it was the most probable sound, given both the visual and auditory evidence, so that is what you literally heard. And if you think that this is some kind of trick or a defect in your, your uh, perceptual system, it actually isn't. So imagine that you're in a crowded restaurant and it's very noisy, and you can see the person's face and you can sort of hear them talking. Well, that visual signal is going to be very clear and distinct and accurate, and the audio signal is gonna be full of noise. Which one would you, know, you probabilistically emphasize? So when the two disagree, it's actually the visual one that's more likely to be reliable, and that's what you're seeing here. So this is the critical piece for VR. The reality we experience is whatever our minds infer to be based on perceptual inputs, regardless of the source. So if VR can provide the right perceptual inputs, we can have whatever experiences we want, and those experiences will feel real. They will be genuine experiences. So I came to understand this personally the first time I stood on the edge of a virtual drop. I felt my knees literally lock up, and I had this overpowering urge to back away. My conscious mind knew I was nowhere near a real drop, but my personal reality was nonetheless that I was at risk of falling. And actually, I will also tell you that I made myself step off, step off that ledge. It took me a couple of minutes, and in that split second before my foot came down, it was just going through my head, you're gonna die. And <laughs> nothing rational, obviously I knew I was standing in a room with a headset on, all these things didn't matter. It's just part of my body was absolutely certain. So, now extend that certainty, that reality of experiences, 
to teleporting around the world, to using virtual objects, and to interacting with anyone anywhere, and the potential power of VR starts to become obvious. So one example that I personally want, and that I think will resonate with many of you, is a virtual workspace with completely configurable displays, holograms, whatever you want, and the ability to click between workspaces instantly. Other people could teleport in. They could work with me. I could teleport into their spaces, look over their shoulder. I'd be much more productive. And work would just be more fun, like when I first got a personal computer. And in fact, there's a direct analogy with the personal computer here. More than 40 years ago, JCR Licklider's vision and Xerox, Park work, Xerox Park's work to make the personal computer, especially that of the computer science lab under the late Bob Taylor, led to the computing devices we all use today. That was the first great leap in human-oriented computing. I believe that VR will be the next great leap. Instead of interacting with the digital world through flat screens, we will be able to live in the digital world whenever we want. So that's my vision of how VR can change the world. But a great many enormously challenging te technical advances will be needed in order to get there. So let's look at what it's going to take for VR to continue down the path to being a key part of how we work, play, and connect with one another. Since VR is about driving the perceptual system, the place to start is with the senses. Vision, audio, haptics, smell, taste, and the vestibular sense. VR is not going to implement the last three in the foreseeable future, in my opinion. But vision, audio, and haptics are workable to varying extents today, and there are potential paths forward for all three. For vision, we need to increase the field of view to the full human range, increase resolution and clarity to the retinal limits, increase dynamic range to real-world levels, and implement proper depth of focus. Audio needs proper spatialization, your sense of where sound is coming from, full spatial propagation, how sound moves around a virtual space, and synthesis, that is, generating sounds for modeling physical motions and collisions. Haptics is particularly challenging. The haptics that would matter most would be for the hands which are our primary means of interaction with the world and which rely on haptics for their feedback loop. All we can do right now is produce crude vibrations and similarly crude forms of resistance. Someday, perhaps there will be some sort of glove or exoskeleton that will let us interact naturally with virtual objects, but that is a true research problem. In addition to getting virtual information into the perceptual system, VR also needs machine perception. That is, the ability to sense, reconstruct, and understand the real world. The obvious use is moving about safely, but it will also be very valuable to be able to bring real world objects, such as desks, keyboards, and furniture, into the real world, potentially reskinning them. It would be even more valuable to be able to bring real humans into the virtual world as avatars. That would enable true telepresence, where you could meet with, work with, play games with, basically do anything you wanted with anyone, anywhere in the world. I believe that this will be the single most important factor in making the use of VR widespread, because people are the most interesting thing in the world to other people. Unfortunately, people are also highly sensitive to the nuances of other people, so enabling virtual humans is one of the hardest parts of making VR real. Finally, VR is the most comprehensively perceptual technology ever developed, so underlying everything is the puzzle of human perception. The key to VR is not the technology that's developed, but how that technology interacts with the perceptual system to create experiences. It's only taken me a minute or two to lay out the broad areas in which VR needs to advance, but taken together, they form an enormous research and development space, one that covers all of human perception and half a dozen areas of sensing and reconstruction. Exploring that space will require world-class research in areas ranging from computational optics, to material science, to sensor technology, and much more. It will also require a great deal of multidisciplinary work, because it is the intersection of multiple technologies that actually makes VR work. So as one example, consider the virtual workspace that I talked about. You would obviously need to be able to use your hands as dexterous manipulators in order for it to be as productive as the real world. And that is certainly a difficult proposition by itself. But let's imagine that we somehow solved it. 
Then we run into the problem that VR headsets have fixed lenses focused at two meters, which has the effect of making everything within one meter blurry and uncomfortable to look at for extended periods. And one meter is everything within arm's length. In short, until we solve depth of focus, we can't get full value out of enabling hands. And similarly, we'd want proper spatialization of sounds that originate within arm's length, and that's another unsolved problem. And of course, we'd want high enough resolution so that virtual monitors were as sharp as real ones, and we'd want to be able to sense and reconstruct our desk, keyboard, mouse, and chair, and we want to be able to do virtual humans. And before long, you realize that pretty much every research area I've mentioned is required in order to build a system that can deliver the right experience. Let's quickly look at three of the many challenges of VR, starting with displays. The display system in a VR headset is essentially just a screen and a magnifying glass. When you look through the lens, what you're seeing is a single magnified image at a single focal distance. The question is, where should we place that fixed focus? On the right, we've placed the VR focus near infinity, out the window. So the right side and the left side, virtual and real reality, look pretty similar. There are some differences, but let's ignore them for now. Because the big difference is that, unlike the real world on the left, when you look up close in VR on the right, the nearest plant, which should be sharp, is now blurry, along with everything else, because the screen is focused far away and your eye is focused up close. So we need a better way of focusing headsets. I don't have time to go through all the science, but I can at least visually take you through a few of the potential solutions that have been proposed over the last few decades. Consider a simple 3D game scene. In optometric units, this would extend from four diopters, 25 centimeters at the front of the car, to zero diopters, optical infinity. Again, to make it clear, today's VR headsets have a single focal plane at, say, half a diopter. Obviously, things very close will be very far from the focal plane and therefore blurry. One idea, which a lot of people have proposed, is to just have more than one plane of focus, displayed simultaneously or in rapid succession. Perceptual scientists will tell you you don't want to let those planes get too far apart or things will get blurry between them, so you're gonna have trouble creating enough planes to get everything in a four diopter range in focus. Fine, the next idea would be to adapt those planes. Researchers at RICO recently attempted this and showed that yes, you can move those planes around if you have the right adaptive optics, but things between the planes will then get blurry. And so Nathan Matsuda, Alex Fix, and Doug Landman at Oculus Research looked at that background and said, well, rather than having many more planes, we'll look at making each of the planes more capable. Let's get rid of some planes and bend the others. So if we use even more complex adaptive optics, now we can have these bendy surfaces so that just one or a few of them can touch every object in the scene. So here are some results. First, let's look at simulation. Here's a, here the distant background is in focus, and now it's the foreground that's in focus. We can look back and forth, and things come into the correct focus with correct defocus blur away from the focal plane. So it seems like this idea has some merit. Of course, simulation always works, so we built a headset like test, like test rig. This is an actual image recorded with a camera. So right now, with today's spatial light modulators, when you put a real camera into the prototype, the contrast is reduced, and the team is working on improving that. But as you can see, it does work. Here a far object is in focus, and here it's a near object. Far, near, we can focus wherever we want without eye tracking. And if you now compare the modern fixed focus display on the left to the adaptive focus display on the right, you can see that this is a potentially exciting new way to try to bring things into focus in VR. The second area I'm going to look at is eye tracking. Eye tracking is a key VR technology, especially as a foundation for many types of computational optics. The state of the art in eye tracking is based on tracking pupils and glints off the cornea. Here you can see how it looks when pupil tracking works well. However, pupils can vary wildly. For example, this and this. Pupils also change size and can change shape. 
and they don't even necessarily change size in tandem. Glint tracking helps compensate for the limitations of pupil tracking, but eyelids can cause problems, not to mention the problems with fitting illuminators and cameras into a headset and positioning them so the tracking works across the full range of eye motion with deep eye sockets, flat faces, and bulging eyes, and is 100% reliable in all those cases. Also, the eye is not actually a rigid organ. The motion at the end is a little subtle, so let's look at it again. Watch the shape of the pupil as the eye stops. The real problem is that the current state of the art in eye tracking tries to infer where photons are landing on the retina from the state of the pupil position and the glints off the cornea. The right solution is to track features directly on the retina. And the really right solution is to actually look at the image that lands on the retina. However, doing that across the full range of motion in a head-mounted display will require development of an entirely new type of eye tracking technology. The third area I'm going to briefly look at is virtual humans, representing real humans in vir virtual space. As I said, I believe this will be the biggest single reason for the widespread adoption of VR. Creating comp compelling virtual humans will require the integration of at least four separate tracking technologies, each of which is immature today. We've already looked at eye tracking, so let's look at hand tracking. Here's what perfect hand tracking looks like. Unfortunately, hands have about 25 degrees of freedom and lots of self-occlusions. So right now, the only way to get to this level of tracking quality is with retroreflector covered gloves and lots of cameras. Faces are the most expressive part of the body with a great deal of subtle flexibility and are perhaps the greatest of all human tracking problems. This is an illustration of roughly where real-time headset-based fa face tracking is. Progress is definitely being made, but there's still a long way to go. Good real-time skeletal body tracking is now becoming possible, although a lot of work is still needed to make it truly robust. <laughs> I had to wait till that was done because otherwise you're just not gonna pay any attention to me. <clears throat> Literal rather than skeletal tracking using consumer-friendly cameras remains solidly in the realm of challenging research. So the underlying technology for virtual humans offers plenty of interesting research questions. But the really interesting question is, what is it that makes an avatar a truly convincing, unique person? That answer lies in the realm of perceptual science and the psychology of social interactions. And the place to start on that is by gathering lots of data. Yasser Sheikh has done this with his panopticon at Carnegie Mellon. Let's look at an example of that, the sort of research that that's enabled. This is work done by Tomas Simon, and it's very cool, but it took two hours to process each second of that video. So it's a little ways off from real time. I'll also point out that if you notice all the dots on the wall in the original video there, every single one of those is a camera. So that's how much data had to be gathered to make that work that well. Those are just three of the challenges that VR faces today. It will take many years to fully solve even those three, and then, of course, there are many other challenges, including the rest of the optics and display challenges, the machine perception challenges, haptic interaction, to say nothing of full body haptics, as well as smell, and someday, the vestibular sense and taste. Although, honestly, I have a hard time seeing when we're going to arrive at the point where you could chew on virtual food and get all that correct, I have to admit. In short, VR is a truly vast space waiting to be explored, and much more research attention needs to be focused on it. Without a doubt, decades of innovation lie ahead. So VR is a grand challenge in the purest sense. Obviously, it is enormously technically difficult, 
and it'll require research and development across dozens of technologies for decades, but that's only half the story. In a very real sense, VR is the culmination of more than 70 years of the computer revolution and centuries of development of information technology. Finally, we are capable of building an interface to the digital world that lets us interact using a significant fraction of the full bandwidth and biological processing that we're evolved for. VR has the potential to vastly expand the range of human experiences. And if it's successful, it will surely be one of the most important technologies of our time. Thank you. All right. That was pretty amazing. Take the middle seat. Uh, I'll take this seat. I'll take that seat. All right. That's good. Um, this is where I start feeling like an engineer. I have nothing to do with engineering. Uh, but I, I've started to feel like I'm getting into something that's smart. I remember uh, on election night in 2008, uh, I was at CNN at the time, and we beamed Will I Am in, among other people. I don't know if anybody, you guys are young, but you may have remembered that on CNN. We beamed him in. It was election night. Uh, we were in New York, uh, and he wasn't. And uh, I, I remember speaking to Nick Negroponte about a year ago saying, what part of, of this sort of uh, technology are you most surprised of, about? And he said, I'm surprised we're not farther ahead, farther down that road of, of a real conversation between two people, uh, one of whom isn't here. Uh, everything you described, and again, I'm, a not, I'm not an engineer, but everything you described seems like something that in the world of Ray Kurzweil and Moore's Law, we should have been able to figure out. And yet you keep describing things as real challenges and big challenges and in its infancy and immaturity. What's the holdup? Well, I like to map this to Xerox Park because Xerox Park really was the first time all pieces came together to connect people with computers. And Xerox Park really rode Moore's Law, right? They, in 1970, they said, OK, we're going to build a bitmap graphics display. It's going to cost $100,000. But by 1983, it'll cost $35. And they were dead on, right? Wow. So you could build these enormously expensive, slow things and say, but we know where we're going to be. But photons don't pay much attention to Moore's Law, for example, right? And human perception pays zero attention to it. And so Moore's Law certainly has been critical in the sense that the amount of processing required to render the scenes to be able to do the computer vision algorithms didn't exist. But it doesn't solve problems like, how do you get a 220 degree field of view with something that you can wear on your head? And um, really, I think what's unique here is the number of different disciplines, the number of different challenges that have to come together to produce a system that convinces your perceptual system right. that it's actually doing this. But it sounds so exciting. What's the thing that's going to push it ahead at great speed? What's the, what's the catalyst going to be? Is there going to be some commercial uh, imperative that it has to meet? Is it scientific? What's the thing that's going to, well, to get us so much faster? The good news is it does have commercial imperatives now, and it has moved that rapidly. I mean, once, basically, once Facebook bought Oculus, mm -hmm. right, that said, OK, real resources are going to be put behind this, because it will take a long time right. um, to build out this next platform. And so there are now millions of VR headsets out in people's hands, and it is there is very strong commercial imperative. So this is a very big change from the first 45 years, which was, hey, this would be cool. Be nice if right. someone would build it. You had experience in gaming. And the other day, I, I read a study that indicated that there's a, a certain level of something that um, uh, reaches the level of addiction uh, with gaming that is affecting productivity of males uh, in a certain age group. And I didn't get a chance to dig deeply enough to it, into it to understand whether uh, it was rigorous, but I, I mentioned it on TV, and I got a lot of responses from people who said, "No, this isn't real. It's not funny. Like it's not. It's not a funny thing. People are addicted to to gaming in a way that can be dangerous." And I've got a question in here, uh, which asks, "How do you prevent people becoming addicted to the virtual world in which they can instantly see and feel anything they want anytime?" Do you think about that? Uh, or we? I not, feel like we are so far away from there a world that would be something that was really a replacement for reality that that is not a concern of mine here. Right. Um, the other thing I'll point out is that you know, the experiences we have are not exactly natural experiences in general. I'd be willing to bet that there aren't a whole lot of people in this audience who haven't spent at least two hours on their phone today in one form or another. And I think that if we were to go back 20 years, we would say, huh, well, what if we do these smartphones and people are using their phones all the time and they get you know, divorced from reality? But, Technologies have pluses and minuses, and overall, they seem to have made our lives better. 
uh, with respect to the concept of the grand challenges uh, and meeting those needs, uh, where do you have do you, do you see specific application for VR in any specific grand challenges? Or one of the questions I've got put here is, uh, you know, at the moment, it's a product for for the global elite. Uh, you see prices coming down to the point that it. It helps. So the interesting thing is that, yes, prices are actually obviously coming down rapidly, and that has been happening. But you know, as, as with most technologies like this, initially there's a small set of users, and it's expensive, and as it gets bigger, I mean, you look at things like the Raspberry Pi, right? My first computer cost me $5,000, and the printer cost $1,000. And those were $1,981. So I mean, imagine that you went out to buy a computer now, and it cost you $20,000. But if you wanted to go out and buy a computer now, you know, it would cost you, what, a few hundred dollars? And it would be a million times more right. powerful. So the answer is that as that base broadens out, what this enables, it enables more people to connect, to have access to information, to interact with virtual objects and constructs, which actually gives them much more effective access. Uh, I want to see if they've got a couple questions out here. I see a gentleman at the mic. I'll take that. And then I've got, I see one person with one of the boxes. Is that correct? Is there another box out there? Okay, there's another box if somebody needs it. Go ahead, sir. All right, so uh, your idea of um, having a virtual workspace sounds very interesting and certainly very convenient, but uh, this is kind of a two-part question. One, could there be, I mean, a lot of people work with very sensitive information. Could this be another avenue that cybersecurity would have to get involved with? And two, what advantage would there be for businesses to put their workspaces online? So in terms of cybersecurity, this, basically works with exactly the same infrastructure we have now, right? The same compute infrastructure, the same networks, and so forth. So I think it has exactly the same concerns. And obviously, those concerns are real, but I don't think it changes the equation there. And in terms of what would be the incentives for business, well, obviously, the incentive would come when what they could offer the user was more valuable than not using it. And so online banking is a good example of that, which comes with new cyber risks, but on the other hand, you know, it's just so much more convenient that most people choose to use it. So I think that those, those risks are understood and they actually map well to the ones that we already deal with. Hi. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for coming out. I use your product for my capstone project. It's awesome. Uh, my question is regarding kind of sensors, sensors like the Leap Motion that have uh, kind of, you know, enhanced virtual reality, as well as Apple currently with their new iPhone, they're going to be using depth sensing kind of sensors as well. How do you see that impacting virtual reality? So that will, over time, have a tremendous impact on it. So when I talked about the need to sense and reconstruct and understand the space around you, what you're seeing are really what I'll call the beginning of a very long path that will come down to the ability to reconstruct that space in a very, very powerful way that will let you. So, when we talk about virtual reality, I want to be clear, we're not only talking about the virtual space, because virtual reality can use exactly what you're describing, depth sensing, for example, to reconstruct the space around you and pull it in to virtual reality. And that is incredibly powerful. It's a form of, you could say augmented reality, but let's just say it's a mixed reality. So I think that in the end, that ability will be one of the core pieces, that mixed reality, of why you would want to be using virtual reality. And Again, it's not just your local space. It's not just that, for example, it could reconstruct this table so that I wouldn't trip over it. But it can reconstruct somebody who is in another town, in another continent. And you can be with that person, right? You can do, essentially, tourism or travel, and you can be in other places. So I think this is incredibly exciting, and I think it's one of the keys to the future. Yes, sir. Uh, I want to ask, what can VR techniques do for now? What specific thing can VR techniques do now? What can they do now? Yes. No. What are they capable for? So one of the things they're, they're useful for is for things like medical training in areas like surgery. They're useful for doing things like architectural design and walkthroughs. They're obviously useful for playing games. They're useful for watching movies. Even the experience of sitting in a virtual theater and looking at a movie but being able to just, when you move, the right kind of parallax happens, it makes it very different from looking at something that's just sitting on a flat screen in front of you. It's um, being applied to education. Um, so the thing about VR is that it's not just a platform. It's actually in the limit. You can see that it is a way to provide all the functionality that we expect out of real life. So as it gets better, 
I wouldn't say, here's the killer app for it, because when you wake up in the morning, you don't say, well, what's the killer app for reality, right? It's all the things that you could imagine doing with it. We just need to make it good enough. OK, thank you. All right, uh, I'm gonna, I've got to move on to the next session. I'm going to do it a little differently. You and I were planning on staying out here, but I think I'm going to give Jeff the, the, the stage. So you and I will leave the stage. We're going to come back, and then uh, first off, when, when Jeff finishes, we'll have some conversation with Jeff, and then we'll have some conversation, all of us, together. So a uh, big round of applause for Michael Abrash. Again, you guys are absolutely fantastic with the questions. Please keep them coming. I want to bring Jeff Dean out. We're, we're on a, a similar topic, but it's a, a different approach, which is why I've decided to sort of keep them separate, but together it's all good. Um, Jeff is a computer science and software engineer within the Systems and Infrastructure Group at Google. He received his PhD from Washington uh, University, uh, and he, it was on whole program optimization of object-oriented languages. Nobody said that was wrong. Um, he worked on profiling tools, microprocessor architecture, information retrieval. Uh, prior to graduate school, he worked at the World Health Organization's global program on AIDS, developing software for the statistical modeling and forecasting of the HIV AIDS pandemic. He joined Google in 1999. He's designed and implemented large portions of the company's advertising, crawling, indexing, and query serving systems, along with various pieces of the distributed computing infrastructure that sits underneath most of Google, uh, Google's products. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Jeff Dean. Thank you. All right, so. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Um, and uh, what I'm going to be talking to you about today is artificial intelligence and machine learning and some of the advances that have been made in the last few years and how they can be useful to look at lots of the different grand challenges. And it can be used as a tool to really improve uh, our ability to tackle some of these challenges. And can we get the slides? <laughs> they were working yesterday. Uh, AV, can we get the slides, please? One minute. There we go. OK. So. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about a technique called deep learning. I'll first describe what deep learning is, and then we'll view deep learning and its application through the lens of the grand challenges. And I'm going to be presenting the work of lots of people at Google, myself, and many of my colleagues uh, within the Google Brain team, and also uh, the rest of Google Research. Um, so deep learning is causing a machine learning revolution. There's tons and tons of interest in using this particular kind of machine learning um, and the reason is that it's actually solving real problems in a way that we don't know how to solve any other way. And I'll go over some of those. So you can see there's growing excitement. I mean, part of this growth is because the term was introduced uh, roughly then, so that helps for growth. Uh, but um, really, what we care about is can we solve real problems? So deep learning, when you hear deep learning, think neural networks, because they're really the modern reincarnation and perhaps rebranding of artificial neural networks, which have been around for a very long time. You know, since the 70s, 60s, 80s, some of the fundamental algorithmic work was done in the 80s and 90s. And what a neural network is, is it's a collection of simple, trainable mathematical units, typically organized in layers, that work together to solve very complicated tasks, as I'll show you. So what's new since the 80s and 90s? New network architectures, people have done some really interesting innovations there new training math a little bit, but really a lot of the training algorithms and systems we're using are uh, very similar to the algorithms that were developed in the 80s and 90s. So one of the key benefits of a neural network is that it can learn features from raw, heterogeneous, noisy data. You can put in very raw things, like raw pixel values of an image, or raw audio waveforms, or the sequence of images in a video. And the system will learn to uh, more and more complex representations of the information in that in the course of learning to accomplish a task. Uh, so here I'm showing you a neural network with several layers. 
It's taking in a raw image of a cat, raw pixels, and then it's, it's going to output a classification of what it thinks is in that image, a cat. So this is, in cartoon form, a very simple problem where we're trying to take an image and determine whether that image is a cat or a dog. So you have to look a little closely, actually, as a human to determine if that is a cat or a dog. I think it's a dog. Um, and what's going to happen is at the lowest level features, we're going to learn, the, the system is going to learn very primitive features, like is there an edge at this orientation or that orientation? Or is this blotch of the image brown or green? And then it's going to build up higher level features that are combinations of those lower level features. So we're going to learn, oh, there's an edge with a brown splotch on this side, or there's a corner. And as you get higher and higher, there's things like ears and noses and you know, whiskers. And then at the end, we're going to try to make a prediction based on the highest level features we have of is that a cat or a dog? And in the most classical setting of machine learning, the kind that works the best today, um, that is less researchy, you can just do this today, is what's called supervised training, where for every training image, we're going to know the true output that we want from this model. We're going to have a human or someone has said, that's a picture of a dog. That's a cat. That's a cat. That's a dog. And what we're going to do is make a prediction from our model. It says, oh, I think that's a dog. And if it gets it right, great, we're done. If it gets it wrong, we're going to make little adjustments to all the features throughout this model so that the next time we see an image, this image, or an image like it, we're going to hopefully get it a little more correct. And we can do that through the magic of what's called backpropagation, which is actually derived from the chain rule in calculus, which I will not go into. But uh, essentially, um, you can make little adjustments. Think of every one of these edges and these neurons as having a number associated with it. And we're going to make little micro adjustments to all the numbers in the model to improve our performance. So functions a deep neural network can learn. We already talked about this one, image classification. But it doesn't have to be just cat or dog. It could be take in pixels and produce a prediction of one of 100,000 different classes. Is it a fireboat or a tugboat or an aircraft carrier or a cheetah or a lion or a wildebeest? We can take in raw audio waveforms and train the model to do that and predict and produce a transcript of what is being said in that transcript, in that audio. How cold is it outside? We can take in words, one word, a sentence uh, in one language, one word at a time, hello, how are you, and produce the corresponding translated sentence purely from observing pairs of sentences that mean the same thing in different languages. So the training data is these paired sentences, and then the model can take an arbitrary new sentence and produce a translation of that. Bonjour, comment allez-vous? We can even take in the pixels of a raw image and produce not just a classification, but actually an entire sentence about that that describes the scene visually, a blue and yellow train traveling down the tracks. So that's pretty cool. So why is this working now, whereas a lot of the uh, techniques were developed you know, 20 years ago? Um, so in the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of excitement about neural networks. And uh, what people observed was that they could work magic on really small toy problems. Uh, but as we tried to scale up, we didn't have uh, enough computational power to uh, actually make them work well on larger problems. Actually, I did an undergraduate thesis on parallel training of neural networks um, in 1990, in fact. Uh, and uh, I was excited because I felt like we could get 64 times as much compute by using a 64 processor machine. And that would be really fantastic. Um, but what it, what it turned out was we needed you know, 100,000 times to a million times as much compute which is what's happened, thank goodness. Uh, and that's where we are today. And so now, neural networks are working extremely well. And it also helps that we have large, rich data sets to use as training data for a lot of the problems that we really care about. So that's where we are. And that's why neural networks are kind of starting to emerge as a really powerful uh, mechanism for lots of problems, as you'll see. Uh, just in computer vision alone, uh, Stanford runs a contest every year called the ImageNet Challenge. And in 2011, the winning team won this challenge with a 26% error rate. And we know that humans on this task have about a 5% error rate. It's actually pretty hard. You have to distinguish between 40 different kinds of dogs and a bunch of kinds of other things. So it's actually not totally subtle. Uh, and that was before anyone used a neural net for this challenge. 
Uh, fast forward, in 2012, people started using neural nets. And fast forward to today, 3% um, error. So we're actually better than humans at this particular task. And so essentially, computers have gone from not being able to see to being able to see. And that's actually a pretty big deal, right? If you think about back in the time of evolutionary biology when animals evolved eyes, that was a time of great change. And what you'll see is that now that computers can see, there's all kinds of applications for it. So you've seen this list already. This is a fantastic list. I really like that it's keep the planet healthy, keep people healthy, and bring joy to people's lives. And that seems like a, an excellent set of challenges. Um, I would add a couple of my own. Uh, I think be, the ability to communicate brings people together, and we have lots of different languages spoken in the world, so being able to so, uh, communicate uh, seamlessly with other people who maybe don't speak my language is important. And I think building general purpose AI systems can help with all of these challenges. So um, I think machine learning and AI can actually help with all of these challenges to some degree, uh, some, some to a lesser degree, and some to a greater degree. But what I'm going to concentrate on is some of these that I think are uh, particularly amenable to machine learning. So uh, let's get to it. So restore and improve urban infrastructure. Um, I think one of, the, one of the amazing things that's going to happen in the next few years, maybe ten, uh, over the next decades, is we're going to transform the way we, we transport ourselves from driven vehicles to autonomous vehicles. And if you think about what that entails, you actually have to perceive the world around you really understand what's going on from the raw sensory data in the car. And so computer vision now working is a really big help for this. But you need to build a higher level view of, that, of the world in terms of which things are cars, which are pedestrians, which are traffic cones, what the traffic cones mean, what the signs mean, what's the speed limit on the street. Um, but once we do that, it's going to transform our cities, right? We won't need parking lots nearly as much. We won't need as many cars. Car will just show up when you want to go somewhere. Uh, you just order it on your phone. It, it's going to be pretty amazing. And that's like a very fundamental transformation of urban environments. One that I'm particularly excited about these days is use of machine learning to improve healthcare. And so um, the computer vision aspects uh, are, are clearly useful in many medical imaging domains. So if you take this problem, which is essentially a uh, retinal image, and one of, the problem, one of the things an ophthalmologist does when you go get your retinal image done is they look at your retinal images to interpret whether you might show signs of a disease called diabetic retinopathy. And they judge that one, two, three, four, or five. And in many parts of the world, there just aren't enough ophthalmologists to interpret these images. The cameras themselves are actually pretty affordable, but really most people are not getting screened in the world because they don't have enough ophthalmologists to interpret these. Um, so if you ask two ophthalmologists to grade the same image, one, two, three, four, or five, they agree with each other 60% of the time, uh, which is mildly uh, exciting. Um, <laughs> if you ask the same ophthalmologist to grade the same image a few hours later, they agree with themselves 65% of the time. <laughs> so uh, we went about collecting a training set of this kind of data and then had each image graded by seven ophthalmologists to reduce the variance in their opinion. Um, and so we got about a million assessments of ophthalmology images, about 140,000 images, roughly seven each. And at the end of the day, we trained a computer vision model to do this task, take ophthalmology images and produce a number, one, two, three, four, or five. And the F score, F score is a, a metric of sort of accuracy, precision, and recall. And the algorithm is uh, slightly better than a panel of eight US board certified ophthalmologists. So this problem, I think, is indicative of a lot of different problems in, in uh, computer uh, uh, medical imaging, uh, where if you collect a, a data set with highly accurate labels, we're going to be able to do good things. Um, similar uh, signs are starting to happen in other modalities. Our group is also working in pathology. And there, we have pretty good results showing that our model in, in assessing uh, Cancer pathology images can actually be better than a pathologist. There's some very nice work from the Karolink uh, Institute in Sweden uh, doing radiology where it performs similarly to senior orthopedic surgeons uh, when presented with images at the same resolution. So, you know, the signs are starting to be here that this is going to be powerful and useful. Um, slightly less clear is 
maybe more abstract kinds of medical interpretations. So given a patient's electronic medical record, can we predict the future? Right? That's essentially what a doctor is trying to do when they, they, uh, they uh, have a patient and they try to uh, understand what kind of diagnoses they might want to make, what kind of treatments. And so deep learning methods for sequential prediction are actually becoming quite good. Um, and I will first talk about some improvements that we worked with the Google Translate team to roll out using a machine learning method and then tell you how this might be applicable for other kinds of sequential prediction problems. So in neural machine translation, Google Translate has been around for a decade, and uh, the system has a bunch of separate components, the existing system uh, that we replaced la at the end of last year, uh, and that's shown in blue. And what you're seeing is a graph of translation quality uh, as judged by humans for a bunch of different language pairs. Uh, and so the blue is the old system, which you can think of as a whole bunch of separate components, uh, about 500,000 lines of code. And the green line here is a neural machine translation system, a deep learning based system that just learns from observations of, say, English, Spanish sentence pairs that mean the same thing. And it learns to translate based only on that. It has no knowledge of the translation task. It just says, I'm going to condition on this input sequence, which is the English. I'm going to produce the rest of the sequence, which is the Spanish. Um, and you can see huge improvements in quality here over the blue system. And in fact, if you look at the yellow lines there, that's hu bilingual human-generated translations as judged by another human. And so you can see that there's, you know, in some cases, uh, a pretty small gap now for uh, these translation qualities. And we know if we train on more data, we can actually make these systems better. OK, so back to predictive tasks for healthcare. So now you can think of a medical record as a sentence. And what you want to do is see part of the sentence and finish it. And if you do that, you can answer all kinds of interesting healthcare questions. Will this patient be readmitted to the hospital in the next 10 days? What's the likely length of a hospital stay? What are the most likely diagnoses for the patient right now? What medications should the, uh, the doctor consider prescribing? You know, and so on. And importantly, I think it's really important that these models also produce some interpretable answer about why do I think these are the diagnoses that make the most sense. Um, and so we're working on these kinds of problems and have some pretty uh, interesting, early, promising results. We don't have, yet have a paper, but uh, we're pretty excited about this, because we think this will be a very general purpose tool that you can use in lots of places in a healthcare organization. OK, engineer better medicines. Uh, so a lot of the grand challenges relate to understanding chemical properties of materials and other kinds of, of things so that we can understand what kinds of things we might want to try to improve you know, uh, medicinal properties or uh, making you know, maybe better materials for making solar energy affordable, these kinds of things. Uh, so we've been doing a little bit of work uh, in our group with quantum chemistry problems. And the input for these kinds of problems is some configuration of molecules. And then you want to run a time step simulation and then eventually get, as output, some properties about that, that, uh, that chemical setup. Is it toxic? Does it bind with this particular thing, which is useful for drug discovery, some quantum properties? And the typical way that chemists do this is they use a very computationally expensive simulator called a density functional theory simulator, which takes, you know, order thousands of seconds to uh, run one of these configurations. Uh, so we have actually been able to use this simulator uh, as a teacher for a neural net. So essentially, we have a neural net now that's going to try to approximate the entirety of that simulator uh, just from learning of observations of input chemicals and output properties. And it turns out you can actually do this. The results are basically indistinguishable from the quality of the simulator, and it's 300,000 times faster. So you can imagine having something as a chemist that's 300,000 times faster might really change the style of, of research you do. You might screen 100 million molecules and say, OK, well, these 10,000 are kind of interesting. Let me now investigate those further. So that's pretty exciting. And actually, we're seeing this kind of property in a lot of different scientific disciplines where they have a very expensive computational simulator to in, uh, get them some understanding of some property. And we think you can use that as a general tool to train a much cheaper ver version of that with high accuracy. OK, reverse engineer the brain. Uh, so this is uh, from my colleague Viren Jain and others in Google Research in collaboration with the Max Planck Institute. Um, 
one of the problem, fundamental problems in neuroscience is we actually don't even understand the connectivity of neural tissue, of how brains are put together. And so one of the ways you can do this is with a technique called uh, the study of connectomics, which is you start with some brain tissue, you slice it very thinly. Uh, the, the, the patient is no longer with us. Um, <laughs> and then you scan those slices with an, an electron microscope at very high resolution. And what you're trying to do then is you're going to have a whole bunch of slices that you know are vertically stacked, but you need to be able to then reconstruct which, which neurons go with which, uh, through which slices and where. And if you are able to do that successfully, you'll get a big jumbly connectivity matrix like this uh, in visual form there. If you prefer matrix forms for your connectivity matrices, then that's the bottom right. Um, and if we had that, that would be powerful because we don't really un even understand the basic connectivity in a lot of, a lot of kinds of animals. And so uh, Viren and his colleagues have been working on this problem and have been making a lot of progress. So this graph is showing you the expected run length in micrometers until you make an error of the reconstructed uh, techniques. And so it's important to note it's a log scale. So this is actually almost a factor of 1,000 improvement in the last uh, roughly 18 months. Um, and so we're almost up to the size of something where we won't make any errors on something the size of a songbird's brain, uh, which is cool. So how does this work? Uh, well, one of the techniques they developed was a technique called flood filling networks, which takes in an image, uh, of the image data, and then starts from the seed point, and then has a recurrent model that tries to make predictions for different points uh, in this image about which things are actually part of one uh, tissue and which parts are, are another. And it jumps around to the most confident part based on the image, but also the predictions it's already made. Um, and so that's it operating in 2D. In 3D, it looks even cooler. Uh, so you can see it kind of trace out one branch of things that is very confident, and then as it ends up losing confidence or it reaches the end, then it jumps back to some other uh, part and starts veering off on that. And that's pretty cool. It gives you these really nice constructions of actual neurons. And um, the next step is they're very close to uh, being able to do the experiment on the full songbird brain and hopefully go from songbird brain to, uh, you know, actual wiring diagram. Um, it, I, I'll point out the scale of this problem is pretty large. The, it's about 600 billion voxels at the resolution of the scanning electron microscope that they're dealing with. So there's a lot of data. So that's cool. Um, finally, I think one of the things that machine learning uh, can be is a tool for uh, everyone to solve different problems in lots of different domains. Um, and so we've been working in this, in this domain for about five or six years, trying to uh, scale up deep learning models and so on. Uh, we actually built an internal system uh, as our first generation system and learned a lot from that. And then we built a second generation machine learning system that's called TensorFlow. Um, and we decided we would open source this so that not just people at Google would, would be able to use this, but everyone in the world would be able to use this. We released it at the end of 2015, uh, and we made a choice to have it have a very flexible Apache 2.0 license, which basically means anyone can take it and do whatever they want with it, pretty much. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but that's roughly what it means. Um, and so the goals of TensorFlow were we wanted this common platform for expressing machine learning ideas and systems in a way where you actually have an executable representation of your machine learning algorithm. Uh, you know, often when you're reading a research paper in machine learning, uh, without an accompanying source code implementation, there's a lot of details left out just by the nature of writing an, an English paper. And you know, it might say, we used a low learning rate or something, and you're like, well, well uh, what does low mean? Um, but when you have an actual executable implementation of something, I think that's a much better thing to accompany a research result. Uh, we wanted to open source it so that everyone could do it, and we wanted to make it uh, a really good platform for both research ideas so that you can flexibly express any kind of machine learning thing, but also for production use. So TensorFlow runs on you know, large data center machines, custom hardware, but it also runs uh, on iPhones and Android and Android, uh, Raspberry Pis uh, and uh, desktop machines and all kinds of things. So you can take your model and run it wherever it makes sense to use machine learning. And uh, this is a graph of a bunch of different open source machine learning packages that are all hosted on GitHub. 
And this is a metric called uh, GitHub stars where people can express interest in a repository. And uh, you can kind of tell when TensorFlow was launched and uh, where it's been going recently. Uh, well, we actually passed Linux's number of stars uh, relatively recently. Um, but I, you know, I think this is a testament to the community that's built up. There's now like 15,000 repositories of people doing things with TensorFlow on GitHub, uh, only 10 of which are kind of our official repositories. And so you can find a wealth of different things there. OK, so AutoML is another thing I'm excited about. This is another engineering uh, scientific discovery thing. Uh, and this is a thrust of research we're doing on automating machine learning, so essentially learning to learn. Um, I think this is important because the current way you solve a machine learning problem is you have some data, you have a bunch of computational devices, and then you take a human machine learning expert and they say, oh, yes, I need a seven-layer network, and I should use a learning rate of 0.1, and then I'm going to train it this way, and that's the way I'm going to solve the problem. And hopefully, once you, you stir all that together, you get a solution to your problem. Um, but the real problem with that is there's probably 10 million organizations in the world that could be using machine learning. They have data in electronic form. If you massaged it right, it could be input data to a machine learning thing, but they don't have in-house machine learning experts. Um, you know, you think of every city in the world has sensor data from their stoplights. They should probably be using machine learning to set their stoplight timing. Um, so if, if we can turn this into data plus a lot more computation, but remove a lot of the need for the machine learning expertise, that's really going to make machine learning a tool for you know, lots and lots of organizations and people. So we're excited about this. And I'll show you a taste of what we're doing. So uh, one of the things a machine learning expert does is specify a model structure to use for this problem. And so here, the idea is we're going to have a model generating model. Uh, and the model generating model is going to generate a bunch of models, uh, 10 of them, say. And we're going to train them for a few hours and see which ones work well and which ones don't. Uh, and then using the error rate of those models, we're going to use that as a signal to train the model generating models, to steer it more towards uh, architectures that worked well and away from architectures that didn't work as well. And here's what it comes up with, you know, kind of crazy. It almost looks like conectomics. Um, but you know, this is not a structure a human probably would have designed, but it tends to work, it seems to work pretty well for this particular problem. Uh, this is a well-studied image problem, and you see all the things the last four lines, human designed neural network approaches uh, for solving this problem. And the, you see the error rate has been going down over time. It was 8%, now it's 5%, then 3%. Um, and this gets very close to the state of the art result using this architecture search approach. And for a different problem, uh, the system, uh, this is a language modeling task, same, same story. Essentially, there's a bunch of human generated results. Per, this is a measure of perplexity, so per, lower numbers are better. And you see the state of the art result for the human design one was 66, and this gets actually above this, better than the state of the art, 62. Um, so there's encouraging signs that we can actually automate some of this stuff and really make a general tool uh, that can solve problems automatically. Uh, but it's just barely computationally tractable today for small problems. So we're going to need more computation. And one of neural networks have two really important properties for computer architecture. So one is that reduced precision is just fine. You know, if you have a, a, like one decimal digit of precision, that's generally enough to get pretty good uh, accuracy when training. And you don't need sort of full floating point accuracy to six or seven digits. And the other property they have is that just a handful of specific operations make up all the computation in all the models I've described. Essentially, a bunch of different kinds of linear algebra, matrix multiplies, uh, uh, vector element-wise vector operations, those kinds of things. So if you can build a system that speeds up reduced precision linear algebra, you're going to be happy. Uh, and in fact, we've been doing that for a little while. Uh, this is our second generation system uh, of a system co we call a tensor processing unit, because it's specialized for those kinds of computations. And this one uh, we announced at Google I.O. and has 180 teraflops of computation on this board, which is four chips. Uh, and it's also designed to be connected together for larger machine learning problems. Uh, so that's a, what we call a pod with uh, 11 and a half petaflops of compute, which is uh, quite a lot. Um, and the really nice thing, normally programming a supercomputer is kind of annoying. Uh, so 
uh, the goal is that these systems are programmed via TensorFlow. So you express a machine learning model, and hopefully the same program will run with only minor modifications on CPUs, GPUs, and also on these TPUs. Um, oh, and we're going to make that available as an external cloud product so that uh, organizations that have large compute needs can actually uh, use those for their own needs. And we're going to make 1,000 of those available for free to top researchers who are doing computationally intensive things in machine learning research or applications of machine learning to sciences um, where they're willing to publish the results of their work. And so we're excited to see what researchers will do uh, with more computation. Uh, so I guess the, the thing I want to leave you with is that regardless of what field of engineering or science you're in, machine learning is going to be a tool that can really make a difference in your field. And so hopefully you've seen threads of things, even if you're not a computer scientist, that can really make you think like, oh, maybe I have a problem kind of like that. That's often how these machine learning ideas spread from one discipline to another. And so if you're not considering how to use deep neural nets to solve your problems, you probably should be. And you can find more info there. So thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. Take the, take the far seat. Far seat. Thank Great. you. Uh, we're six and a half hours into my day, and I'm officially in over my head. I have no <laughs> idea uh, what went on there. So I will have no introductory questions. Um, <laughs> but I, I do believe that you knew exactly what you were talking about throughout the whole thing. Uh, I, I have a lot of questions from you out there, so I'm going to try and, and uh, balance all of that for now. Let's start over there. Oh, it's working? Yeah. Uh, my question for you is um, how efficient do you think neural networks is on the uh, optical character recognition? And I have another question that is like, um, how many positive and negative images do you think is required to uh, make your classifier more efficient? Right. Uh, so optical character recognition systems are actually use, that use neural nets are actually getting quite accurate. Uh, we actually have a, a public uh, a vision API in our cloud system where you can just give it an image and it'll read all the text that's in that image uh, in you know, a bunch of different kind of scripts and fonts as well. Um, in terms of data efficiency, which is really at the core of making machine learning sort of more practical for a lot of more situations, you know, I think one of the problems that we have today is we generally train a model for one thing. And we need to build up a big training set because it needs to learn everything about the world from that one training set. Sometimes we might do transfer learning where we train a sort of a general image model, and then I have uh, images of just the couple categories I care about, and I have a few examples of those. But in general, we should be building models that you know, solve a 1,000 tasks at once. And then when the 1,000 and first one comes along, we can build on the knowledge in solving the first 1,000 tasks to say, oh, it's a lot like these other six or seven you know, outdoorsy, woodsy scenes. So I'll build from the representations I've already learned from that to make it so that you need many fewer examples for a new problem. All right, I want to take one from the app that says, uh, Rajiv Shah, who was here this morning, uh, mentioned Elon Musk's claim that uh, machine learning and AI represent an existential threat to humankind. How can we help enable people to feel more meaningful when so many uh, are more replaceable than ever? Yeah, I mean, I think this is actually a, 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 a problem that governments and policymakers really need to be thinking about, because I think one of the properties that machine learning has is that if, as you've seen, if you have a task that is amenable to specifying as a supervised machine learning task where you can collect a larger data set, you can actually do a pretty good job of training a computer to do that task. So there's a lot of fields where what people do are you know, a handful of repetitive tasks. And it's not just sort of lower skilled versus higher skilled. If you look in the medical imaging domain, many medical imaging uh, specialists do those kinds of repetitive right. tasks, but someone like a general practitioner does 500 things one day, 500 thing, completely different things the right. next day. Right. So um, it is going to be uh, an issue that policymakers need to wrestle with. Is, is, it, is there logic in thinking about it economically as something that creates greater value-added work, but not necessarily less work? Well, the way I would view it is we're going to have these incredibly powerful tools, and they're going to get better and better. And we're going to be able to do more as a society with those tools. And there's going to be 
you know, some figuring out of what this new technology now enables us to do with these tools, which will engender new kinds of occupations. Got it. All right. But governments should be thinking about how to bridge the gap. And, right. And I, I mean, the danger, of course, is that we may not be smart enough to be thinking about that. You know, we've got to, I certainly can't help in this conversation. Go ahead. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you for uh, Dr. Dean uh, for introducing us about the uh, deep learning, the general knowledge about deep learning, and also uh, inform us of the uh, of the platform as TensorFlow and Cafe and others. And I think it is very good to make the uh, to make the deep learning framework uh, more accessible and easy to learn for the public. Uh, actually, my major is computer science, so I'm asking. Is there an overheating of the deep learning? Because you know there are several ups and downs in the deep in the artificial intelligence in the last decades or the last centuries. And uh, before the uh, the thriving of deep learning, there are also other uh, algorithms like SVM and DPM. So perhaps uh, like several years later, there will be another winter for AI. For example, so now even a high school student who know how to compute the gradient can uh, can build a deep learning framework themselves by stacking several layers together. Or uh, like in the VR, like uh, several years ago, as far as I know, uh, there is a trend in investing more in the VR companies. But now I think there is a coming down in the investors in investing more money in the VR companies. And uh, third. Uh, yes, as uh, as I said, uh, that in the image net computation, uh, the object classification uh, challenge has been removed from the challenges. Uh, yes, um, so due to these uh, situations and phenomena, so what are your uh, opinions about the negative points of the trend of AI and the uh, practical use of the deep learning technology? Thank you. Sure, you want me to start and then... So I, 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 I think, my head's going to catch um, on fire. So <laughs> you guys have. Hopefully, this. mine won't. Um, so I mean, I think the reason we went through AI winters in the past is because there was a lot of excitement and and promise and uh, potential for solving problems, and then some of those solutions didn't really pan out, and so people got a bit disillusioned and said, "Oh well, maybe we shouldn't like be focusing on this." Here, I think the situation is a little bit different in that we have a technique that can do some stuff that is clearly pretty important. So the, the ability to have really accurate computer vision models yes. is going to make it so that just that alone will have a huge number of applications across many, many industries. Um, and so I don't think we're going to go back to a point where people say, oh, this stuff doesn't really work. Right? There are definitely going to be problems that we can't solve with the techniques of today, and we'll run into those walls, and we'll have to figure out how to break through them. But the underlying technology, I think, is useful enough in a, in a broad enough set of things that I'm not, uh, I don't think we'll have the same kind of winter we had in the past. Well, I actually would like to reinforce that a bit, which is the measure is whether a technology like this becomes a foundation for a lot of other things. So I talked about the difficulty in tracking humans. It's now part of the hand tracking pipeline. It's now part of the face tracking pipeline. It's now part of the body tracking pipeline. It's just, it's almost like saying, well, what if we hit a computer programming winter? I mean, it's part of everything now, and it's applicable to an amazing variety of things. Yeah. Um, I've just never felt so stupid in my life. Uh, you, over there. It's, it's an interesting feeling. <laughs> yes. Um, so I actually was hoping we could go back a little bit to what you were talking about with Elon Musk. And I uh, um, know you mentioned that it's something that the government and various other institutions will just simply have to think about. But one of the things that they are thinking about is putting in regulations for AI, something about once they swarm the streets, it'll be too late. Um, so I would like you guys to potentially comment on whether you think regulations in VR, in AI, are um, valuable, necessary, or sometimes excessive. I'm glad you asked that. I've got about five iterations of that kind of question okay. on the app as well. So my view on the AI safety issue <coughs> is there may be a long-term, like, far-off, distant future, but it doesn't uh, concern me because we're sort of, like, barely lifting off from Earth, and people are wondering like, how we're going to like, colonize the next set of stars. right? Um, 
And really, I think there are clear AI safety and policy issues that uh, around fairness, around safely deploying uh, learned systems in environments. Uh, and those things are very pressing and near. And so we actually have some, some of the effort in our, of our research in our group is to figure out uh, sort of concrete, shorter term AI safety problems that we can work on as we start to deploy things like self-driving cars or robots operating in an environment like this, you want them to behave safely. So that's the more pressing challenge. I think the longer term things are a little abstract and hard to really uh, be actionable. And there's a wide variety of opinions. So I, I'm less of the we will be taken over by all the robots. That's yeah. more of the optimist. Uh, we're going to do great <coughs> things in tandem with our robots. Well, on the VR side, I mean, Elon wasn't talking about VR. And I think, as I said earlier, <laughs> VR definitely has things that need to be studied and need to be appropriately um, regulated if that's the right thing to do. But it falls under the same kind of health and safety and I guess I would say personal effects that many other types of technologies do. I think this is well understood where I think that what he's saying with AI is, you know, literally the Terminator's coming, right? I mean, that's, it's a different kind of thing and it's much less analyzable and familiar. Right. What? Yes, over there. Okay, so I'm a statistics master student from the engineering department at Rice University. So uh, we always make jokes about like ideas are cheap, show me the results, at least your code. So um, my question is that like um, for many like fancy deep learning methods like the a forest, random forest, or like the recurrent neural network, or non short term memory models. We always know it's not hard to use those models. What's hard, how we can connect the reality with those models, because we made bounds a lot of assumptions which can be like not in the real life. So, do you, um, can, could you offer some tricks about how to resolve those kind of questions? Very quick. Sure. I mean, I think the whenever you're deploying a machine learning system, one of the most fundamental concerns you have is, does the data I trained on, does that match the distribution of the data I expected to be tested, Test tested the data. on? Yeah. And if that's not the case, then these systems, uh, this is kind of one of the AI safety issues, is then these systems can make very wild and unpredictable kinds of, of assessments of things. So you need to be careful when deploying one of these systems, that the training and test distributions are, you know, matched. So that that's an example of that. There are many other kind of concerns like that. Um, but like when you are training, like you are training your algorithm in the training dataset, but you cannot promise it will still have a good result in your test data, like in your future dataset. Like how to uh, decrease the uh, disparity of those two things. Right. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of work on uh, neural nets that can also produce confidence estimates. Yeah, like so that. if they're very confident, they would give you a high confidence estimate. And if they're not confident, then you might take that into account in the broader system in which you're using that mm -hmm. that that learned uh, component. So we're, we're about out of time, but uh, I, I this is so good and so smart, and I have no idea whether it makes sense. But uh, I'm going to take one question from over there. The guy with the, yeah, you. Uh, right. Yes. Uh, dear Professor, I, I'm from Beihang University. I'm asking questions of something connected to aeronautics. Uh, I'm doing the research of solving the uh, jet engine problem with uh, machine learning, and I found that there's a question, there's a problem that we, that in uh, in the real world, the things are just analog, and we try to uh, measure the thing with digit, just like analog circuit and digit circuit. And sometimes the, the model is very precise. It can predict the problem. And sometimes it's the things just came so analog. And we cannot give a precise model or just precise description of the problem. And uh, that's, I think, where the machine learning can just not give so precise answer to what the reason for the fatigue or just for the problem. And uh, what do you think about? How will we solve this challenge? Is this more about the model is producing an output, but it doesn't give you an interpretability aspect about why it's saying this, or it just produces incorrect results? Uh, the output is just sometimes not so incorrect. And sometimes there's problem with 
uh, we cannot just find uh, the, uh, the proper input. Yeah, I see. So, I mean, I think, you know, one thing that can help is uh, generally more data is better. Um, the other thing about interpretability, I think, and this is, this is another example like healthcare where you actually care, you know, why is the model saying engine broken? Because <laughs> you actually want to be sort of confident or maybe go double check as a human, like, oh, yeah, it said this spanner was broken or this, this strut or something. Uh, and I think that kind of interpretability is useful in a lot of domains. So that's definitely an active area of research. We're out of time, and I know that if I got the rest of the questions, they'd be amazing, and I can see the ones on here. They'd be amazing. Next time we have this conversation, we're going to have it for longer. Um, I don't smoke, but if I did, I'd have a cigarette right now. <laughs> um, let me tell you, uh, here's the plan. Uh, you've got your codes on there. We need to be back in here at uh, 3... 30 in your seats, please, if you could. Uh, no, I'm sorry, that's incorrect. 340, please, if you could. We're gonna take a break until 340. Thanks, everybody, and a big round of applause to these two. This is kind of amazing. Michael, thank you. Wow, you guys are something else. <laughs>